So I'm sort of a machine learning geek. I've been uh, working in the field for about 22 years on machine learning applications, um, starting with uh, credit card fraud detection. So this was my first job, credit card fraud detection. So uh, you know, we used uh, data from banks all over the world. Uh, the goal was to detect fraudulent transactions as they happen. Uh, we built machine learning models that went into the authorization systems of credit card processing uh, uh, organizations. And when a transaction came through, a neural network would score it for the probability of fraud. And if possible, it would sh stop that transaction in real time. So no more losses were incurred. So there was this company called HNC Software in San Diego that did this. And um, at that time, credit card fraud had been climbing through the roof. And uh, this was a huge boon to the banks and made a very, very big difference in their profits. But this, uh, and then, you know, uh, after about uh, eight, nine years uh, in that company doing a variety of things, I joined Amazon.com as their first VP of fraud prevention, affectionately called the first VP of fraud at Amazon. <laughs> uh, so, <laughs> This is sort of my job in all of these cases, right? In the data transformations that I had to do, most of my time was spent in taking data from all of these sources, uh, understanding the patterns, cleaning the data, munching the data, featurizing the data, building uh, test models, uh, evaluating their performance, uh, then changing the model and iterating all of that. So it was a lot of grunt work. And 90% of my time was cleaning and featureizing the data and very little on the algorithms and anything innovative. And especially when you are a PhD coming out of a college, you have a slightly different orientation, unfortunately, in your mind. Uh, and this is how I felt. <laughs> like, oh, why did I do a PhD? How are my, you know, is this, is this what I really did a PhD for? 80% uh, of the time was spent preparing the data, 20% of the time, it felt like, was spent complaining <laughs> about the need for preparing data. Well, you know, 99% of computer users cannot program either. Well, so the thing is, today is 2017. Unfortunately, very little has changed. And the vast majority of data scientists, people who work with data, spend time cleaning the data, uh, even though, you know, this data science role was sold as the sexiest job of the 21st century. And you see that, you know, recognition in all of these publications as well. You know, New York scientists would say, hey, and uh, New York Times for big data scientists, janitor work is key hurdle to insights. So, uh, so my dream, even in 1995, was, hey, how could I actually get rid of all of this heavy lifting? Um, at least could I learn the featureization? And I couldn't obviously find an immediate thing for more structured data on how to avoid the data cleaning process. Although these days, lots of progress is being made on applying machine learning and data wrangling techniques to automate a bunch of these. But then another dream was, hey, can we at least automate the featureization? Now, that area, we are actually finally seeing some progress with deep neural networks, especially for image, uh, text, natural language, and that type of data. The traditional structured data in databases and logs, etc., we still haven't fully cracked the nut, but for a lot of the unstructured data, text and, you know, and uh, natural language and images and speech and audio, uh, on all of those, we're starting to make significant progress with DNNs. So you can actually say, look, my no featureization. I didn't have to do complex signal processing to generate features out of these. And that's very, very exciting. So what's deep neural networks, right? The rise of deep neural networks, especially, it's, it's, about, it's uh, about 10 years now that deep neural networks have actually caught on. Uh, in fact, it, does anybody here know what really triggered the big step change in deep neural networks? Uh, any, uh, yes, what's? Uh, better da data and computational. It, it was better data and computational, but there was like one specific data set that was compiled that actually drove this uh, progress in deep neural networks. And it was not even an, uh, just a simple algorithmic advance. It was just one particular data set. Anybody? I was going to say hidden in that well, um, Actually, the answer is the ImageNet data set 
uh, compiled by a Stanford professor called Phi Phi Lee, and the ImageNet competition that was created was the primary driving force to accelerate the development of DNNs in the last 10 years. Now, um, the thing was, once the dataset was compiled, people started applying neural networks to it, and they found that applying deep neural networks really helped improve performance over the state of the art that was possible in vision. And then that was a major breakthrough, and then it drove a very accelerated cycle of development. So very few people know that a compilation of that data set was actually so instrumental in driving the growth of deep neural networks. Now, anyway, so what deep neural networks are, uh, you know, they are really neural networks, which have been around for since the 1980s as a very popular technique for machine learning, uh, and uh, it's just much deeper. And what happens is very, very deep neural networks are able to learn extremely sophisticated representations that uh, uh, shallow ones were not able to do. And they're able to go into the tail of the data, especially when you have a very large amount of data, and like in vision, it's really important to understand the, uh, uh, understand the tail of the data, not just model the macro features of the data distribution. If you look at images and you look at their macro features, you'll see it's a lot of, it's a lot of uh, things about various, uh, variation in brightness, variation in the colors, uh, variation in where it's captured. Those kinds of macro details are not good enough to understand the content in the image itself. So to understand the content, the precise content in the image, you have to go into modeling much more fine-grained statistical features, which deep neural networks are able to do, and that's why deep neural networks have become very successful. And so now they're used in computer vision, language translation, speech recognition, and more. And DNNs uh, have become the de facto uh, cutting edge uh, uh, algorithm to apply for all unstructured data when you have lots of data, okay? If you don't have lots of data, you can't learn the tail, obviously. There's not much tail to learn. Okay, great. But deep neural networks are also extremely challenging to deploy in online services and in real applications period because some of these are gigabytes in size because they're really big with lots of parameters and it's very hard to deploy them, score them. It's very hard to learn them, first of all. You need GPUs and multiple weeks of training sometimes on very large data to learn them. And there's a lot of art around it, and lots of people don't uh, succeed with it unless you are actually practiced in that art of getting these deep neural networks to work. So that it's very costly to develop. It's very costly to deploy. But if you can do so, you can actually have some really powerful applications. Okay, so uh, th this is uh, just you know pictures of how these things look. Uh, the, the you know you take a very large image data set, you know power it through a deep neural network, you learn the neural networks layers learn different complexities of features. In the earlier layers, you will get a you know, basic edge kind of feature detection. In the uh, towards the middle, you get more sophisticated features, and at the highest level, you can even get you know things like faces being recognized uh, and so on. So so that's the uh, deep neural network's ability to learn concepts at multiple levels of abstraction. Okay, so the question when you're talking about accelerating AI development, uh, especially for these kind of things, is how can you really scale up deep learning? And that is a very important problem at this point in time. It's one of the cutting edge scenarios. And so let me uh, play a video here that shows why it's important to do so. Um, so I'll... Uh... The promise of AI has always been to make lives better and do things that we're doing now on our own in a much more efficient and much more powerful way. But to do that, AI needs to learn. And to learn, it needs information. And one of the best sources of information we have on the world and how it works is hidden in the video cameras all around us. A phenomenal amount of video is generated every year, and it's not just the hundreds of millions of cameras all around us, it's the billions of cell phones that we all keep in our pockets. Prism is a cloud software company that connects the cameras that already exist in the marketplace and analyzes that video in a way no human can. It slices and dices the video and puts that into our data structure so it's searchable and available to customers. Microsoft is a big part of the smarts that help the indexing and understanding of video happen. To use Prism, all you have to do is pull out your phone and 
type in what it is you're looking for and where, and Prism will find it. The value comes from unlocking the hidden information in video, and that can be just as valuable for a factory or a construction site or hospital as it is for a retail store. Prism also takes that video feed and turns it into a stream of information that can be used to let that business run better. Microsoft's computer vision API can understand different kinds of objects, texts, other types of information. Merchandisers might use us to look into their stories around the world, or people in retail operations might use us to build a dashboard of important metrics. Places like hospitals or healthcare facilities can use PRISM to understand where their doctors are so they can more quickly connect those doctors with patients. In verticals like industrial or construction, PRISM can be used to help track really important critical machinery. If you're on a construction site, and you wanted to be notified when the cement mixer arrived, you can use AI to do that. Prism brings a really unique set of content into the world of AI and machine learning, and Microsoft brings some of the best technology and people in the world to help understand that content. It's an exciting time, and the coolest thing about it is we're just getting started. Great. So now let's show you a demo of accelerating AI development of DNNs. And the scenario we're going to show is one we call snow leopards and scaling DNNs. It's on a data um, set of snow leopard images. So to do that demo, let me invite Ted Wei, uh, my colleague in crime. Ted? <coughs> All right. All right. Thank you, Joseph. So I'd like you to take a look at this image and tell me what you see probably take you a second or two, but you'll notice the snow leopard at the bottom right. And this is the motivation with the work that we're doing with the snow leopard trust. Finding snow leopards has been pretty difficult. There's only about 6,500 of them left in the wild and the snow leopard trust is committed to, to protecting them. And so they know that snow leopards roam in an area of about 1.5 million square kilometers. They set up camera traps, about 42 traps over the years, they've collected about 1.3 million images. Um, even then, it's only covering about 0.1% of where snow leopards roam. But you kind of get an idea of the problem that they're facing. As a nonprofit, when they need to do a survey, they're collecting all these images. It takes 300 hours just to do a manual survey. Because every time there's motion, that camera is triggered. Whether it's going to be livestock, whether it could be a blade of grass swaying in the wind, um, all these things would result in these images. And so this is where really, just like the video you saw, the ability to be able to apply AI to help nonprofits, other businesses like Snow Leopard Trust, to be able to enable them to automatically classify these images. So what we're using is something called transfer learning. So as Joseph mentioned, uh, you have these amazing deep neural nets today that can extract really cool features from images. So something like ResNet 50, which is a deep neural net, uh, is pretty good on various animals. Give it a picture of an elephant, runs it through the deep neural net, extracts the features, and, it's, and it classifies it as an element. So how do we take, make use of all of that goodness in a deep neural net and apply it to your specific application? So what we're doing is, transfer learning where we're taking images of snow leopards and then just chopping off one or more layers at the end. And so we use a deep neural net as a featureizer. It's still looking at the images, it's extracting the features, and then those features become an input to a classifier such as a logistic regression classifier from Spark ML. And now we can train it to be able to do binary classification to determine whether there's a snow leopard in the image or not. And we're using a library called MML Spark. You can go to GitHub today and I'll show you a link in a little bit, but you can download this to really be able to help you accelerate your development of AI applications. If you were to use something like plain Pi Spark, and uh, in this case we're trying to look at the adult income, uh, the adult census income data set, basically you have to import this, and there's a lot of things that you have to do. Every learner is very specific. So keeping track of feature column names, uh, manually encoding the categoricals, uh, doing manual vector assembly because the learner expects that. Every learner is different. Every learner has different conventions. There's a lot of ceremonial code that you have to write just to be able to do uh, these, these tasks. And now you have to convert the label to a format expected by the learner. So a lot of this code using MML Spark can be condensed into just a few lines. And so this is a library that we're making available. It's open source on GitHub to be able to help you develop a lot more quickly. 
And so without deep futurization, if we were to just use something like OpenCV, we could get about 68% accuracy on snow leopard classification. But using deep feature, uh, futurization, we can get up to 89% accuracy. And so just to show you the code, right here we have uh, we have our MML Spark library, and I'm not going to run this. I already ran this because um, it's going to take a, a few minutes to run. But basically, what we're able to do now is importing the cognitive toolkit models. So these models are available to you so that you can also use them. Um, reading the images here, and now we're going to load the metadata, and then constructing the model. And you can see here where I'm using things like the image transformer or the image featureizer uh, from the MML Spark library to be able to make things a lot easier. Um, and now I'm building my logistic regression classifier, taking the features from that deep neural net, running it through uh, my logistic uh, regression classifier, and then evaluating the model. So I'm training it, and then I'm testing it. So now I have the ability to be able to build a Spark pipeline. And with that Spark pipeline, there are a lot of things I can do with it. I can, I can uh, package that up into a Docker container, um, and then be able to inference uh, based on that. So now, running my Snow Leopard images through the Docker container, now I can determine whether there's Snow Leopard in the image or not. And so, so I'd encourage all of you to jump here to, uh, to check out MML Spark. Podium PC? Oh, Podium PC, okay. Okay, to be able to check out MML Spark on GitHub, uh, you can just run this, run this command too, it's just uh, run the Docker container, and it's just a really cool way to easily get started. And as Joseph mentioned, because of these deep neural nets, they're, they're getting really, really complex and really hard to serve on CPUs. Okay, great. So as we look at the types of hardware, the silicon alternatives are available to us to be able to serve deep neural nets. On the scale of flexibility and efficiency, we have our CPUs at the left. Uh, CPUs, you know, are very general, but the price you pay for being very general is performance. And CPUs are just processing things uh, sequentially. They're general but slow. Um, for GPUs, they're basically able to process things in parallel, so you get things a lot faster. For all you gamers out there, you probably also know GPUs are expensive, so it's not that easy to be able to just buy a lot of GPUs and run them. Um, at your far end of the scale and efficiency, you have your ASICs, which are application-specific integrated circuits. So these are chips, basically, that have the circuitry burn onto them. If you open up your, say, your air conditioner, your dishwasher, those little black chips, that's basically an ASIC. Um, the nice thing about them is they're very efficient, very low power. The problem is that once you create that circuit, it's set. If you had to create anything new, you would literally have to recreate that circuit, go to the factory, uh, order more, and then install them. FPGAs are field programmable gate arrays, and they sit in a nice sweet spot between flexibility and efficiency. And so you have the ability to be able to flash that chip with a model such as a deep neural net. And then once that chip is in there, whether it's going to be a factory robot, whether it's going to be a drone, whether it's going to be a driverless car, you have the ability to be able to update that model and update that chip without having to change any hardware. So the nice thing about FPGAs is one, just from a performance perspective, you can see that you can get tens to hundreds of teraops. You can get performance 10 times or even more than CPUs and GPUs. Um, and in terms of flexibility, because DNNs and machine learning AI is rapidly evolving, as things change, you have the ability to be able to flash different models onto that chip without having to change the hardware. Microsoft has the world's largest cloud investment in FPGAs today. If you were to um, use Azure, Azure uses FPGAs for software-defined networking. In Bing, you also use FPGAs today for uh, query serving. And talking about Bing, these are actual production results from December 2015, where they took one of their models, ran it on software and uh, CPUs, and you can see that on software, it's running slower, latency's higher, FPGAs, latency's lower, and you can serve more queries per second. You can also see that the average FPGA query load on the lower right is actually higher than CPUs because you have so many more queries that are uh, able to be run on that FPGA. So I'm gonna, do, I'm gonna show a quick, quick demo of FPGAs. So Bing uses a model, which uh, very simplistically what Bing does is every time you serve, every time you give it a query, it takes that query string, 
takes a document, runs it through a big complex model, and gives you a relevance score. Takes the same query string, runs it through a different document, gives you a relevance score. Very, very simplistically, then it sorts all the results and gives you the top ranked documents. Any, any search engine does this. So if we were to take this model, run it on one CPU, you can see that I can run about two or three documents per second. And so that just gives you an idea of just how expensive these deep neural nets are. I can only run, it takes me half a second to run this model. And in a typical scenario, what I would do is throw more CPUs at the problem. So I have a Bing server. These servers are many, many thousands of dollars. 24 CPUs drawing about 300 watts of power, and I can get to about 80 documents per second. There's less contention on the CPU, so now on the CPUs, and I'm able to get more throughput, which is good. But let's see what happens if we take that same model and run it on 24 FPGAs instead. So now I have that model burned onto 24 FPGAs. And you can see here that it's getting about 15,000, 17,000 documents per second. So really the ability to be able to accelerate AI, to enable you to have, make use of the fastest AI cloud on the planet from a software perspective in terms of the libraries to be able to accelerate development and also hardware uh, perspective to be able to accelerate running all of these models is really what we wanted to. So thank you very much. Thank you, Ted. Awesome. Day. So you saw a lot of things there and let me just recap what we, uh, what we showed. You know, First of all, we showed taking a data set of really hard to detect, uh, it's a data set of images, it was really hard to detect things like identifying a snow leopard in the wild. And there are only a small number of images of these even. I mean, they do have you know, a few tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, maybe low hundreds of thousands. Um, but what you know, you're able to do though, is to take a deep neural network that had been trained on millions of images Take that and draw up, uh, draw that as a featureizer, and then use that as the basis on top of which to learn to classify snow leopard images, right? So you did that. And to do that at scale, you needed a platform like Spark. So Spark was a platform in which you hosted the data, the big data, and then you ran all of this featureization in a distributed way. You learned the model to detect snow leopards. And then, you deploy that. And so when you deploy these models, you need speed. And so traditional CPUs are slow, and so you need custom hardware like FPGAs to make these executable at low latencies, like 15 millisecond latency, incredible throughput, and low cost as well. FPGAs are uh, potentially a hundred to thousand times uh, cheaper than just using a CPU. And so then we showed that ability as well. And so you have stitched all of these capabilities together, the ability to take a, a pre-trained featureizer, learn on Spark with a custom data set, deploy it into hardware, and create a web service in the cloud that can in the future be used to detect uh, snow leopards, right? And so that's a pipeline that a lot of custom machine learning applications will go through. And Python and PySpark is a very integral part of that pipeline to make that flow happen. So you can build and deploy a custom machine learning AI application in the cloud. Okay, great. So now, how about making all of this easier to get started? Um, one of the areas where we have invested a fair amount is in the IDs and tooling around machine learning period. Uh, not just machine learning, but there's a much more general purpose, so you can do any data science with it. So many of you know about Python tools for Visual Studio, which has been very popular for quite a long time. It has about 60,000 monthly active users. Um, we launched our tool for Visual Studio in GA a few months back. Its users went from approximately 4,000 per month last summer to around 7,000 in May. And then we have hosted free Azure notebooks, Jupyter notebooks on Azure. It's super popular, super popular with universities. There are about 208,000 notebooks now hosted on the cloud, and this is free. We hosted in lightweight Docker containers, and so we are able to offer a free service there. And then we've got uh, a plugin now for VS Code. Uh, there's a VS Code Python community extension. That is actually 2.8 million downloads and is ranked the number one extension downloaded for VS Code. And we just hired Don, who's been 
bringing the author of it into uh, Shah Rukh's team here that runs Python. So uh, we have an exciting investment, collection of investment in uh, Python and our, um, uh, uh, in Microsoft. So we do yet another thing to make these things easier. Now, in the earlier demo, I talked about a full pipeline. It turns out uh, when you really build an application in production in enterprise, you're composing many, many different services together. You have services to bring data into the cloud. You have uh, uh, services in which you wrangle the data, transform the data. Then you have to plug in identity. You have to plug in any multiple collections of components. So how do you make it easy to build these kinds of solutions? And how do you provide a kit, so to speak, that makes it easy to plug these things in and create end-to-end -end applications? That's what we address with Cortana Intelligence Solution Template. So you can go to our website called Gallery, Cortana Intelligence Gallery. If you search it in any search engine, you will find Cortana Intelligence Gallery. And there you will find reference architectures for common scenarios. And these are built on you know, best practices of designing, such as a Lambda architecture for you know, both streaming analytics and batch analytics. Um, then it'll, it can automatically deploy to the cloud subscription, and it's customizable. So uh, here are examples that you will see on the Cortana Intelligence Gallery. You will see, say, if you want to build a loan credit with SQL Server or personalized recommendations in the cloud. How would you build a personalized recommendations application in the cloud by composing together many services, including machine learning? And so it's possible to uh, create an architecture, a reference architecture like this, that can actually, with a few clicks, be instantiated in the cloud. So you're uh, bringing all these services up, provisioning them, connecting them up, setting up data flows, and you are able to create a full architecture for creating personalized recommendations. So that's what the Cortana Intelligence Solution templates do. And then the third thing that we do is provide uh, tooling like data science virtual machines. So for people who are really expert data science users, having a very good virtual machine installed with all the components that they need to do data science effectively is actually very, very useful. So in, otherwise you have to get a virtual machine, then download and install every piece of software, and you know, there's a lot of complexity involved in just even setting up your data science environment. So the data science virtual machine makes it easy. It includes all the key popular tools, whether it be R, Python, and Julia, or deep neural net tools like TensorFlow and CNTK and others machine learning libraries like even H2O or MXNet. So we bring all of these pre-installed in a data science virtual machine and it's been very, very popular. So that's sort of our tooling story. So a collection of development environments, Cortana Intelligence Solution templates, data science virtual machines. Now the third part of the story is about bringing AI to the data platforms. Now there are really powerful data services available today on Azure whether it be a database like SQL Server, or a big data service like HD Insight that runs Spark, or a big, uh, an even bigger data service uh, called Azure Data Lake that allows you to run jobs, jobs for uh, data cooking. Uh, all of these are very powerful platforms offered as fully managed services on the cloud. So then the question is, can you make it possible to run AI inside those data platforms right next to the data without moving the data out. And that's very powerful. So let me tell you a little bit more about it. The, this is sort of the concept of bringing computation and algorithms, in this particular case intelligence, to where the data lives and where the data is produced as opposed to moving data to where you want to do the algorithmic compute. That's actually a very important principle in accelerating and deploying AI. And why is that important? So um, bear with me a minute. I want you to think about the time before databases were invented. Well, before databases were invented, when people built data-driven applications, the application had to do a lot of heavy lifting. It had to figure out how to organize the data. It had to figure out how to schematize. It had to figure out how to index the data. And it had to be all secure, highly available, backed up, reliable, and all, all that. Now, when database management systems were invented, we separated that function and abstracted it out and removed it from the application tier. 
So database management systems then became really great at storing data, indexing it, schematize, uh, creating schemas, uh, allowing joins, query processing, query optimization, access control, security, backup, failover, reliability, everything that is required to build an industrial strength application. Okay, that made the application development dramatically simpler. So people invariably just put their data in a database and the application tier just connects to that database and forgets about all of this heavy overhead associated with data. Unfortunately, the way most AI applications are built today is like the time before databases were invented. Okay, so what people do is the application tier for AI or machine learning tier really it connects to lots of databases. It pulls in the data, it uh, joins them, it computes variables, it builds machine learning models in there, it deploys it in that same application tier. And then when you have to build a highly available, reliable, secure, compliant application enterprise, right, an application that doesn't go down, the application tier, the AI application tier, is, becomes incredibly hard to build and maintain. And it, it just really is incredible overhead. So why would you want to replicate all this heavy lifting that databases solve for you already? Wouldn't you, wouldn't you be much better off actually moving the AI into where the database is and just letting the algorithm run inside the database and inherit all the benefits of that database, the compliance boundary, the security, and all of that? And that's the, uh, that's the key direction. So with SQL Server 2017, which, we, which is in community technology preview now, 2.0, and it's uh, going into production in a big way. We brought this principle to life. So for, this is a really, by the way, the first commercial database with AI built in. AI, it has AI stored procedures in R and Python. So any R and Python code that you actually uh, write can now run inside SQL Server in the secure compliant boundary. An individual query can now include R scripts or Python scripts. And by the way, SQL Server provides for concurrency and throughput and all of that, it's managed. Um, it allows uh, failover, it has replication, it's backup, all sorts of features that come in database. All of that is inherited by the application now. And then in that uh, same uh, SQL Server, you now also have support for analyzing complex relationship with graph data. So when you want to do machine learning on interrelationships and graph data, now that's possible as well. And it incorporates machine learning even for speeding up query processing. It's got you know, unparalleled performance with adaptive query processing. So when you bring all of that to life, what you can do is to uh, leverage all the benefits of an industrial strength database to build a very powerful AI application extremely simply. Most of the complexity is living in the database server and the AI application can be a very thin layer that connects to a database and issues quote unquote intelligent queries or AI queries. The best way to see this um, is really with a demo. So now let me invite Sumit Kumar to show a demo of SQL Server with Python uh, actually building a sophisticated AI app. Take it away. Thank you, Joseph. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, I don't think I need it. I'm very excited to show you the deep integration of Python in SQL Server. And I'm going to show you how to build and deploy a Python application um, completely inside of SQL Server. And not just any application, uh, a GPU-powered deep learning application that does a classification of medical imaging data. All right? So let's uh, switch to this demo machine. So what you're seeing here is um, an app, a patient portal app that you could find in a radiologist's office. So I come in and I uh, want to see the report of a new patient. So I load up the report for that patient. And so far everything is just normal looking uh, patient portal app. But when I hit this analyze button, there is a deep learning model running in the background that goes and analyzes hundreds of images that make up this person's uh, CT scan and comes back with a suggested probability that this person has a chance of having lung cancer. Now this uh, augments my judgment as a doctor and um, increases the accuracy and speed of detection, right? That has huge uh, advantages for both healthcare cost savings as well as for patient outcomes. Um, so typically these applications are uh, very uh, hard to build. Uh, so uh, in the learning phase, uh, we take, took all the images uh, and then we generated features from it. We used uh, transfer learning using a pre-built uh, DNN model 
uh, that comes with the cognitive toolkit that we are using in this application. And from the features and the labels, you train a classifier model. And in the application, you're using that model to score the new data that comes in, right? Um, so there are quite a few challenges in this, in this process. Uh, first of all, the as Joseph was saying, the intelligence has to be built in the application. That means the data scientists and the application developers have to work hand in hand. Um, oftentimes, they are in different orgs. They're using different set of tools. So that uh, presents a lot of challenges. And then uh, the data needs to be moved to the application. Um, and oftentimes, moving you know, petabytes, gigabytes, terabytes of data around is not easy. You have to build massive amounts of data movement infrastructure for that. Um, so often, you're forced to work with samples. And in deep learning domain, uh, if you're working with smaller samples of data, your uh, model quality uh, is impacted. Uh, and that is if you're allowed to move data around. In medical uh, domain like this, you're just simply not allowed to move data out of the compliance and secure boundaries like SQL Server. Um, so in, in this app, though, I didn't have to do any of that. Um, the, all the data, model, features, everything is sitting in SQL Server in a secure way in, uh, in different tables. And all the compute, all the um, AI logic is uh, written in Python code, which are embedded in SQL scripts. And the application on the right hand is just making a call to a stored, sim uh, simple one line call to a stored procedure and getting all the intelligence. All right, so let's switch to. the machine again. And so uh, here's the uh, actual app code. I'm using VS Code. And rest of the code is just plumbing and layout, et cetera. There's just one line that is serving all the intelligence, which is just making a call to that stored procedure. So the real magic is all happening inside of SQL Server. Here in SQL Server, uh, the, the image, these are the uh, actual images uh, stored as NumPy arrays and uh, in, in a table called scan images. And there are these uh, stored procedures that are doing all the gener feature generation, uh, doing actual model training, and doing the actual predictions. So let's take a look at one of the stored procedures. This is where we do the uh, uh, feature generation. Uh, this looks like any other regular uh, T-SQL script, but it has this special system stored procedure called SP execute external script, which knows how to take Python or R script and execute it from SQL. Uh, and it takes one of the uh, parameters is, is the script, actual script. So here is where the actual Python code is. So I'll not show you the whole thing, but just some relevant lines of code here. Okay, so here I am loading the uh, cognitive um, toolkit mod, mod, the ResNet 152 model that comes with uh, uh, cognitive toolkit. I didn't have to train that complex DNN model as Joseph described. That takes a lot of exp expertise, time, and resources. So I was able to leverage it as is. And I'm in this loop, I'm cycling through all the uh, images uh, for the entire corpus of data. And I'm doing some additional manipulations, again, using open source libraries like OpenCV. And then I'm generating features here. And I'm inserting that those generated features back into a SQL Server table. So the data never leaves SQL Server. Um, so one of the things, again, even with the pre-trained DNN model, the actual feature generation is a very compute intensive process. So this machine has a number of GPUs. I was able to leverage that GPU using the cognitive uh, toolkit again. and because of that, the entire featureization of more than a quarter million images was done in less than an hour. On a, this is actually a regular data science VM that uh, uh, Joseph was talking about. Without GPU, it takes more than 30 hours. So it's about 30x advantage. Um, so then uh, once the features are written, I again uh, use these uh, different uh, stored procedure to uh, train the uh, classifier model. And in this uh, final um, uh, scoring, oh, sorry. Wrong. Anyway, so in the scoring uh, stored procedure, again, I'm making using that model and taking the new patient's uh, features and generating scores. And the, the application was, again, just making a one-line stored procedure call. So that's the power of SQL Server, the uh, commercial database for AI and machine learning. Thank you, Joseph. Thank you very much, Thank Sumit. You. Right. 
So Sumit showed uh, a very simple application development uh, scenario with AI using SQL Server. And you, know, you can actually now download it at this website. In fact, if you search it, you will find SQL 2017, a full developer edition downloadable with which you can actually do AI and have AI run inside the database. So now let's talk about bringing AI to every developer. Well, most developers are really not in the business of building AI from scratch and would really love to have AI functions available to you. You know, in, you know, my dream would be in many ways, a lot of AI just becomes like a sort function in a programming language. Now we can't quite achieve that, but we can simplify a lot of AI functions and offer them as REST APIs in the cloud. So that's what Azure is doing with uh, APIs called Cognitive Service APIs. Um, and we have a, a very, very uh, rich collection of those things. And so let me actually go to the Cognitive Services collection. So there are a number of APIs for understanding content of images, for recognizing faces, for creating chat applications, uh, for even training deep neural networks. And so here is a list of things that's available. You have APIs for vision, you have APIs for language, you have APIs for speech, for search, and for knowledge. So on vision, it'll be computer vision, face recognition, emotion detection, content moderation, filtering out objectionable content, those kinds of things. Um, on language, it is text analytics, it's spell check, it's web language model, linguistic analysis, and so on. In speech, it would be speaker recognition and actual speech recognition and then search a lot of them and so on. Imagine the power of these available to you as a simple API call into Azure that you can just integrate into your applications and make the applications be actually really smart without a lot of work. Now, this is the power of the cloud, by the way, behind AI. Now, vast majority of functions will eventually become just APIs. I mean, you're already familiar with Bing Maps and Google Maps as simple APIs you can integrate in applications. Very soon, you will have tens of thousands, perhaps even in somewhere in the future, million AI apps or hosted on the cloud, which you can just seamlessly integrate in your applications. It's very, very powerful. So then you will end up actually having, uh, having applications that can actually see, hear, listen, understand, respond to people. Um, and it can even be done on custom data, you know, data that you actually uh, have, care about, like snow leopards, not just anything on wild on the internet, but just things that you really care about. So your know, custom vision service, custom language understanding to understand specific speech components and commands you give, or speech service and custom search and so on. So we are on a very rapid innovation track to launch lots of APIs that democratize AI. Again, the power of this is best seen through a demo. So let me invite Carlos Pessoa, who's a, a developer in my team, who's built some amazing applications just by wrapping these APIs. He's able to do that in a matter of days and build extremely powerful AI applications. So Carlos? Yes, sir. Let me just switch here. Not going there. If I connect the cable, that would help. All right, there you go. Um, so what Joseph just showed you, like the cognitive services, um, they, they are very, very powerful for, for developers. Basically, like years and years of research and all this AI is right there. All these APIs are web APIs. Um, so for any platform, any, any language really, if you can make a HTTP request, you can tap into all that power. And suddenly like your app can understand um, all these, these things that typically humans can. So um, for the past year and a half, I have been um, working on an effort to try to showcase um, some of these APIs through some end-to-end -end stories. And one of the ways that that work materialized was through this, this application called the Intelligent Kiosk. It's a universal web for, for Windows, but uh, like I said, it would work in any platform. 
And uh, in this particular one here, um, what I'm doing here is just augmenting a camera. Uh, in this case, this is a regular RGB camera. This is a regular laptop. And then it's there. You can see it's predicting my age, my, my gender, emotion. So if I smile there, see, happy. Um, and and uh, on, the, on the bottom right here, you see the latency um, that this is taking. And it, within that time, it's doing all this computation. And it's even trying to identify my face. And in this case, it's not doing it because I haven't um, done that yet. But I saved that so we can do it live together. So you see how fast this is. Um, so associated with the face API, you can, um, you can create um, labeled faces um, by name, and then you can provide samples uh, for, for those names. And in, in this case, my app here happens to integrate with Bing Images, so you can, um, it, by that name, it tries to find images. The first one happens to be me, so that helps. When I click this button, look how fast this takes. Boom. So that now that network, uh, the, the, the DNN behind all this, that's doing all this face analysis, it now um, knows that face and it's comparing at that, that same speed. And this could be like thousands of faces. It's not just one. Um, it's, it's really cool how, how it scales out. Um, another, another service that we, um, we recently launched is the ability to create your own image classifier. And basically what there is is what we just talked about a lot earlier today, having a DNN wrapped up in the cloud that you can basically go and tailor to your needs. And I have done that already with a few different models. I have one for traffic conditions, one for weather conditions and radio categories. So for example, if I take and want to target a picture against this one, if I take, for example, this one here, like a school bus, it gets scored as a school bus. And all I had to do as a developer, all these, all these APIs are available for you to train and score against. I just had to like label pictures on that. So if I go here and look for the school bus, you'll see the pictures that I labeled. Not, not a lot. Um, but what I wanted to do here is to create a new one. So I have two objects here. I have a Pepsi and a Coke um, bottle. And we try to together very quickly here create a model to identify them. So I'm going to start by um, labeling the name of that project. So I'll call it drinks. I will, call, um, I will add the first tag, that, that's the Coke tag. And again, like this is going to be images, trying to find images. So I'm going to just take five pictures. I think it's the minimum that we require. And sometimes you need more. We're going to see how it's going to do um, with just five. As you can imagine, the pictures that I'm uploading here, they're slightly different than the one I'm going to score with my webcam. The angle might be different. Um, let me take one more. Um, let me take this one here. Somebody holding. There you go. Um, let's do one for the Pepsi. Let me put Pepsi can there so I get more of the can photos. There you go. And again, like I'm going to click that train button, and then um, you're going to see this is going to be about a few seconds worth of time. Um, and I didn't have to deploy anything, create any machines. This is all in the cloud. I have a REST API endpoint that I can uh, call and score against. So when I go back here, now I have my, my model. And we're going to see if it's going to work uh, or not, or if we might need to augment with some more images. Um, but let me bring up the camera here. Let me just point uh, and see how that's going to work. Oh, that's not bad. It was 100% confidence it's a Pepsi and about 18 of a Coke. And probably because of the shape of the, the can, like there is a lot of similar features between the two. So let us try with the Coke, um, the Coke bottle and do the same thing. Yep, 100%. So there you go. We just did it together here, just a few seconds and it's all. Um, available to you today. If you have Azure subscription, you can get these keys and go and do the same, the same type of thing. And Wee Hong is going to show one more scenario around this as well. Where you have your mic. So 
one of the things that Carlos has showed, right, is just in a short period of time, you can create really powerful applications. But this is PyCon, right? And one of the things that is back of your mind right now is that if you look through all the cognitive services, right, there's a huge amount of cognitive services that you can use today, right? From vision to being able to detect uh, gender and so on and so forth, right? Or even being able to detect landmarks, right? And on top of this, you have also other kinds of services, right? One of them being, uh, which is also part of cognitive services, is translator services, right? And you say, well, I have now a rich set of collection of AI functions, as Joseph calls it. If I have a Python application, how can I invoke it without training the model, without worrying about the infrastructure, and so on and so forth, right? So one of the things that you see here is we have pre-created uh, a cognitive service. In this case, it's a translate API, which will take any arbitrary text uh, in any language and translate it to a target language of your choice, right? And what I'm going to show you next really quickly is how then you can invoke this uh, in your code, in your Python code, right? So right now what you see here is a really simple uh, notebook, right? And of course, we're just putting in the subscription key, which is returned to you by cognitive services, right? And let me just run this. And then of course, you specify a bunch of REST APIs or URLs that you can invoke, right? In this case, these are all given to you in the portal. So I'm just going to specify them. Once you have that and you have the subscription key, then you go on to get the access token. Right. And at this point, I'm all ready. I'm all ready to do translation right, right there in your Python app. Right. And this just walks you through what does translation, uh, how does the translation API works, and so on and so forth. Right. I'm not going to go through this, and you can find this online. But let's see translation in action. Right, right now, what I have here is a text, which is in French. Uh, I think French is a beautiful language. I'm still trying to pick it up. Right. And I'm going to say my target language is English because most of us speak English in this audience. And I'm going to click on this. And observe what happened, right? I have specified the source language, the target language. And right now, I'm just going to invoke the AI function in the cloud, which is cognitive service. And I'm all ready to show you the response, right? And therefore, you have your original text. Right there in your Python code, you invoke an AI function, and it returns you a beautiful French text. That's all we have for, for you today. Thank you. Thanks. Great. Thank you very much, Bihong. So there are three revolutions brewing in computing today. The revolution of the cloud, the revolution of data, and the revolution of intelligence. Every software application of the future is really going to be at the corner of the cube defined by these three axes. All in the cloud, all in with data, and applying AI to that data to drive intelligent customer experiences and intelligent business processes. So today, in the review, I already covered a whole collection of these. You know, inferencing with FPGAs to make things hard, uh, fast in the cloud. The cloud, because of its economies of scale, can deploy custom hardware for AI that is accessible now to every developer in the world. That itself is a big step change. That's what uh, uh, specific hardware like FPGAs allow you to do. There are solution templates we can provide to compose many very sophisticated services available for data and AI to build entire applications in the cloud. Um, there are things like data science virtual machines and databases like SQL Server available in the cloud or on premises with AI embedded in it. We talked about deep learning in Spark. We talked about cognitive services, custom vision, and a number of demos that you just saw from Carlos Pessoa illustrated a number of these scenarios. And then we talked about also uh, capabilities like Azure Machine Learning. So this is just really the tip of the iceberg in the coming AI revolution. Um, so think about this. In um, about uh, 1769, James Watt invented the steam engine. The invention of the steam engine heralded the Industrial Revolution. The few decades after the invention of the steam engine was entirely transforming for, for the planet. We are today at a similar juncture. The intelligent cloud is a steam engine of the 21st century. And the decades before us is really the time of the intelligence revolution. 
Thank you very much.